Do you have this class outside today? All right. Um, we've got some uh, material over lipids and membranes to get through. And we made pretty good progress yesterday. And we will make more progress today. So um, last time when I closed, I showed you what a lipid bilayer uh, looked like. And I like this uh, depiction. Um, it shows you um, quite clearly that the bilayer uh, obviously is um, named that because it has two layers, an outside layer. And these big round balls that you see uh, on the uh, top here, the blue uh, guys, they are um, the polar end of the uh, uh, lipids that are there. That would, that would be in the case of um, the uh, glycerophospholipids, that would be the phosphate end. In the case of the sphingolipids, that would be the uh, carbohydrate end, uh, that is the, uh, the glucose or sugar containing end. Um, and um, on the inside, we see the little tails. These are the fatty acids that are attached to those. And they're very nonpolar, and so they associate with each other. And so then on the far inside, we see the uh, blue balls again. And the blue balls there, again, are the uh, other um, portions of the, um, the, the equivalent portions of the same uh, phospholipids that have the um, uh, phosphates or the um, um, uh, sugars, uh, if they're glycerol, if they're sphingolipids. So this layer, this lipid bilayer, is really um, interesting. It's flexible. Okay, so I said we needed to have flexibility. It needed to be sort of fluid, and that was uh, an important consideration. And it turns out that this uh, uh, lipid bilayer provides excellent protection for the cell. Excellent protection. All right. This bilayer is very difficult to cross for most substances. Now, that's both good and bad. It's good if you don't want things coming in and invading you. It's bad if you're trying to get things like glucose or nutrients inside. So cells have solved that problem by selectively having transport proteins in their lipid bilayer that move the desired substances across the lipid bilayer. So I'll repeat that. They have transport proteins within their bilayer that helps to move desired substances across. So for example, there are virtually every cell has transport proteins that will move glucose across, because glucose is a sugar that's needed for energy for cells. Okay? And there are many, many transport proteins that are involved. We'll talk a little bit about some of them uh, in a bit. We've already talked about the sodium potassium ATPase, which moves sodium and potassium ions, for example. Okay? That was one good example of a uh, transport protein. OK, so that's what a lipid bilayer looks like. One thing I should point out about the lipid bilayer is that there are a few things that cross it very readily. Okay? One of these few things is water. There are four things. Water crosses it very readily, which is kind of surprising because part of it, it's, it's not very um, hydro, hydrophilic, but, but water crosses readily. Carbon dioxide crosses readily. And that's important because cells produce carbon dioxide during respiration. Oxygen crosses readily. And that's important because, of course, cells need oxygen to do oxidation. And last, this isn't very desirable, but carbon monoxide also crosses very readily. So those four things cross the lipid bilayer very, very easily. Most everything else requires some sort of transport protein to move it in the desired direction. Okay. Well, let's, uh, I've already talked a little bit about unsaturation. So unsaturation, you may recall, is when we have a double bond located in a tail of a fatty acid. That unsaturation, I didn't mention it yesterday, but I'll mention it today. I actually mentioned it in the highlights uh, yesterday. That unsaturation is almost always with a double bond in the cis configuration. Almost all biological uh, unsaturated fatty acids have cis bonds in them. All right. Well, we hear about trans fat. What does trans fat mean? Trans fat derives its name from the fact that the fatty acids in trans fat 
have trans double bonds. Well, how do they get there? Well, nutrition majors probably know this, but if not, they should, and I'll tell them. And that is that trans double bonds get into fatty acids by the phenomenon known as partial hydrogenation. Partial hydrogenation. What happens when you add hydrogen to double bonds is they become single bonds. Why do they partially hydrogenate something? They partially hydrogenate it for the reasons we saw yesterday. One, it raises the melting temperature. So for some things that you're cooking, like cookies and so forth, it's more desirable to have something that's at a, a higher melting temperature. And you can take an oil that would be a liquid and make it more of a solid if you partially hydrogenate it. The byproduct of partial hydrogenation, notice it says partial hydrogenation. If it were complete hydrogenation, then you would be converting it completely into a saturated fatty acid. So we're not doing complete saturation. We're doing partial um, um, hydrogenation. And partial hydrogenation leaves, as a byproduct, a trans bond. That trans bond is pretty nasty. It's pretty nasty. The more we study trans fat, the more we see problems with things like atherosclerosis, more like inflammation of arteries, more like higher cholesterol levels, a lot of problems. I always tell students to go home, look at everything that you've got in your cupboard, and look at the number of places where it has the words partially hydrogenated blank. Okay? It may say on the label, no trans fat. That's not the way to tell. Okay? Look for the words partially hydrogenated blank. Because if it has partially hydrogenated blank, it has trans fat in it. Period. Why does the label say no trans fat? Because the food industry has gotten through a loophole. I see some people smiling. They know what I'm going to say. A loophole that says any serving that has less than one gram can be considered zero. So if you make your serving size small enough, you just brought your trans fat level down to zero. Look for the words partially hydrogenated blank, and you will have trans fat. Yes, sir? A very, very small percentage of them occur trans. Nothing like what you get by partial hydrogenation. Uh, I, I can't comment on specific ones. The most common place I know that you will get trans fat is actually from beef. Um, I don't know about coconut oil. Uh, coconut oil has other problems. Uh, coconut oil is mostly uh, saturated fat, okay? And that's one of the reasons it, it's, it's going to be more solid at room temperature. And um, it has shorter fatty acids, so it becomes sort of quasi-fat versus oil. Yeah, yeah. But coconut oil has its own problems from a health perspective, so I would be careful with that. Okay. Question, other questions? Comments? How many people have heard that about serving size? Okay. okay. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir here then, aren't I? Okay. All right. Um, saturated versus unsaturated. Um, you put those into a membrane. One of the reasons that a membrane is more fluid and less solid at a lower temperature is there's a lot more chaos when there's more unsaturated fatty acids in there. To make something a solid, it actually has to do the equivalent of crystallizing. You've seen how water crystallizes. A fat is doing the equivalent of that, and crystallization requires order. This is not very ordered. So it takes a lower temperature to get it to actually start to solidify. That's what happens when you have the double bonds in there. OK. Cholesterol. Another thing that we find in uh, membranes that's a lipid is cholesterol. Okay. Cholesterol has a basic structure that looks like this. And you'll notice that it's mostly nonpolar. This ring, these rings are completely nonpolar. These methyls are completely nonpolar. The only part that has any affinity for water is the hydroxyl group on the end. And you can see it's sticking its little nose out there, touching water. That's the only part of cholesterol that, is, um, that, that likes water. Now, cholesterol we find in membranes all over. Okay? Cholesterol is an important component of membranes. People think of cholesterol, they think bad, right? Well, our body's making cholesterol for a reason. 
One of the reasons is it does help manage membranes. So cells have cholesterol for membranes. To give you an idea about the importance of cholesterol, okay, if you take brain tissue and you dry it down, get rid of all the water in brain tissue, about 14% of the dry weight is cholesterol. Your brain is loaded with cholesterol. Okay? So it's there because membranes need it for function. OK. Now, this illustrates a little bit better in, in terms of a figure what I said earlier in words. To go from a um, gel, and by the way, I think I used the term gel yesterday. Probably fluid is a better term to use for describing a liquid membrane. To go from a more organized state to a more liquid state requires either temperature or it requires structure, as we see here. So that's why things that have double bonds in them, which disrupt this order, cause things to be a fluid at a lower temperature. So that's a very important consideration. And that's, again, why one of the reasons why the polyunsaturates are important. And that's one of the reasons why fish Fish oil is full of polyunsaturates because fish are in this very cold environment. Yes? I'm sorry? No. Cholesterol does not cross readily, no. It's, it's found in them. There are some steroids who do cross, okay, yeah. To my knowledge, cholesterol doesn't cross real readily. In fact, steroids themselves don't cross, nothing crosses as readily as the four that I mentioned. The four that I mentioned go very rapidly through membranes. Yeah. But you're, you are correct that some steroids will, in fact, cross the lipid bilayer. Yep. OK. Um, butter versus margarine. OK. Um, saturated, monosaturated, polyunsaturated, et cetera. Um, here's coconut oil. Coconut oil. 13 grams of saturated fat um, in, what is it, about a, uh, about a tablespoon, I think, okay? It's so it, what's that? It's got butter beet. It's got butter beet, <laughs> yes, it's got butter beet. So a lot of saturated fat there. You want to be careful um, how much of that that you're getting. Um, margarine is made by partially hydrogenating vegetable oil, okay? So butter is bad, is my opinion. Margarine is worse. Okay. For example, I don't use margarine. I won't touch the stuff. Okay. I think margarine is one of the great uh, frauds that's been perpetrated on uh, the American public. Okay. Well, I said earlier that there were proteins that were embedded in the lipid bilayer that performed functions. And I want to schematically show you some of those proteins uh, here today and talk about them. So, in this organization, we're looking at the lipid bilayer. The bottom part here is outside the cell. The upper part is inside of the cell. This is how we would see things organized. There are four different classes of proteins I'm going to uh, illustrate here. And it turns out there's a fifth that we'll actually uh, talk about later. But the four classes of proteins, number one is what we call an integral membrane protein. An integral membrane protein projects through both layers of the lipid bilayer. A protein that is involved in transporting things across the membrane will, in fact, be uh, this guy here. I can see my camera light is on. That's not supposed to be on. Excuse me just a second. I'm trying to run my battery down. I won't have a video when it's on. Um, why is that on? Well, the battery's holding its own, so I guess we'll stick with it, but it shouldn't be on why that came on. Oh, well, OK. So four different kinds of membrane proteins. We have integral membrane proteins. They go through. And the integral membrane proteins are ones that will be involved in transporting molecules, because they can grab something out here and move it into there. OK? Number two, those are membranes that you can see that are pretty much buried there those are what we call embedded 
membrane proteins. They're not real common. Embedded membrane proteins. Okay. Number three is a group of proteins we call associated. That is, they're not in any way attached to the lipid bilayer, but they associate with it. Perhaps they like the glycerophospholipids. We'll see a couple of examples later of associated membrane proteins. But they're close, and you usually find them around the lipid bilayer, but they're not physically attached to it. And last, the group number four is what I call peripheral membrane proteins. They're embedded in one layer of the lipid bilayer, but not both. And by the way, the names I'm giving you here are my own. All right? Some people call number three peripheral. All right? I don't call it that. To be peripheral, I think it's got to be embedded in part of the membrane. So for this class, we'll call number four peripheral, not number three. Okay? Three is simply associated. Okay. Well, that's the, those are the classes that are there. Yes? Number three is associated. Yeah. Yes, question? Yeah, as I said, they're not real common. Uh, there are proteins that are involved in helping to um, uh, do things called flipping. One is flipping the, uh, uh, something, a, 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 a glycerophospholipid on the surface with another one on the outside. And so that would be one thing that you might find an embedded protein doing. They're not real common, like I said. And they'll have, they may have protective functions, catalyzing reactions to uh, prevent oxidation, for example, of the, of the fatty acids that are in there. Yep. Yes? Top is inside the cell. That's right. Other question? What was that? Top is inside, yeah. And this is outside the cell down here. OK? All right. Um, anchored membrane proteins. The fifth category is something that we call anchored. All right? Now, these guys, excuse me, are, this is actually a bad example that, that um, I have. Well, actually, this is, this is the wrong example. This, uh, let me back up. This guy on the right is an example of what we would call um, a, an integral membrane protein. But it's actually, it actually has a couple things going for it. But one, it, it crosses the lipid bilayer, as you can see here. It's also anchored by being attached to something that's stuck in the lipid bilayer. So this guy is both, is both integral and uh, anchored. That's kind of odd. Uh, more importantly, this guy on the left is simply anchored, meaning that the protein itself isn't embedded in the lipid bilayer but it's attached to, in this case, a fatty acid that is embedded in the lipid bilayer. OK? So that's what an, what a, an anchored membrane protein is. It's attached to something that itself is embedded, but the protein isn't embedded in the lipid bilayer. OK. All right. Um, flu, OK, I like this picture. OK, the fluid mosaic model is something I'll mention briefly. but. The picture is kind of cool. It shows you, um, again, a, um, uh, a lipid bilayer. It shows you proteins that are embedded in it. You can see, in this case, you've got peripherals that are on the inside. You've also got peripherals on the outside. Peripherals can occur on either surface of the lipid bilayer. And the reason I know that the top is the outside is because of all these guys up here, the red and the green and, and the blues. Okay. These red and green and blues are carbohydrate residues. Carbohydrates are sugars. They're joined one to another. They're what we would call oligosaccharides. You may have heard of oligosaccharides. O-L-I-G-O-S-A-C-C-H-A-R-I-D-E-S. And it'll be in the highlights if you didn't get it there. OK. Oligosaccharides are identity markers for cells. I like to think of them as license plates. We always find oligosaccharides on the outside of cells. Never, that, that is, positioned on the outside of cells, never positioned like this on the inside of cells. We would never see them, for example, attached to this protein on the inside of the cell, because it wouldn't have a function. But on the outside of a cell, it can help to identify a cell. So for example, when we hear about somebody who's had an organ transplant and their body has rejected the organ because of incompatibility, what's happened is that they've been transplanted with an organ that has on its surface a different pattern of oligosaccharides than what the patient, 
that, that was than what they originally had. So the donated organ had a different group. That different group is recognized by the recipient's immune system as foreign and it attacks it. So one of the considerations in transplants is trying to match those things so that you have less of an issue with rejection of the organ. Right? So these are important considerations in identifying. And, I, and th these also we see in blood cells. So you've heard of A, B, A, B, and O blood types. They differ in what identity they have on their surface of oligosaccharides. Okay? So again, very important identity markers for cells. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is kind of a cool tool that we use in uh, biotechnology, and these are liposomes. Okay. What are liposomes? All right. Well, I've already described them to you previously, but I didn't give a, give a name to them. A liposome is an artificial lipid bilayer. An artificial lipid bilayer. I said yesterday, if I took a bunch of glycerophospholipids and or sphingolipids, and I put them in a beaker full of water, and I shook them up, I said they would automatically themselves form a natural lipid bilayer. And what they'll do is they'll form a structure that looks kind of like this. Okay? It looks kind of like this. So if you look at that, that's not unlike how things might look within a cell. Right? There's a little central chamber in here that's open. There's the polar groups in white. There's the polar groups in white on the outside. And there's the nonpolar stuff in yellow on the inside. Okay? The difference between a liposome and a micelle is a micelle doesn't have that opening in here. It only has one layer, and they all the, the inside of this is nonpolar, whereas this guy has an opening, like a cell does. This could be like in the cell, that this would be where the cytoplasm would be located here. But why do I tell you that? Okay? I tell you that because these structures are very cool for delivery of things into cells. They're very important for delivering things into cells. It turns out that there are some compounds that are very difficult to get across the cell membrane for the reasons I've been telling you. It's difficult to move across that lipid bilayer and deliver things directly into cells. Okay? So there are some, for example, anti-cancer drugs that are perfect. They kill the cells, no problem. But they're really hard to get inside of the cells. Okay? So liposomes provide one strategy for getting these guys into cells. How do you do it? Well, let's take this compound that you um, want to get into a cell. You mix it with a bunch of glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids. You shake it up. This automatically forms my cells in that little chamber in there. Guess what you get? The drug. So what? Well, now when you take this lipid bilayer and you smush it with cells, what happens is they fuse. Because cells have the same lipid bilayer that these mice cells do, and when they fuse, the Oreo, the Oreo cookie center goes into the cell and zaps the cell. So liposomes are really useful for delivering compounds into cells. Make sense? So it seems, she says, it seems like if you shook it, it's easy to get them in by shaking them up, it, they, they would come out really easily. Well, that's not really true, because the liposome itself forms a fairly stable structure, just like the cell membrane forms a fairly stable structure. So they don't come out. Okay? The only way they get in is during the encapsulation process of the liposome forming. That is, the liposome forms around the drug, and so once it's formed around it, there's no getting through the layer. So it's, it's in. So it doesn't come out for the same reason it won't go into cells very well, because it doesn't cross the layer very well. Yeah? Um, do liposomes occur naturally? Do liposomes occur naturally? Well, in a sense, they do, because all cells have the equivalent of liposomes. All cells have to do is start making glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids, and they will make the membrane of the cell. So in a sense, I would say yes, okay? But these are man-made ones that we're talking about here. Okay, good questions. All right, um, let's talk now about the movement of materials across the membrane, because that's what I've been alluding to, and I haven't quite gotten there. All right? Let's think about a membrane. You guys probably played the experiments in basic biology class where you had the, um, 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 
the tubing. I can't remember the name of the tubing. The dialysis tubing. Thank you. My brain isn't working today. You've got dialysis tubing. And dialysis tubing is um, a very cool uh, set of tubing such that small molecules can move through it fairly readily, okay? like water, for example. But other bigger things can't move through it, like proteins. So if you take some dialysis tubing and you put some protein into it, and you put it into a beaker of water, what, and then you close off the end so it doesn't uh, leak out, what you will see over time is that the dialysis tubing will swell. And the reason it's swelling is because the proteins can't get out, water diffuses in to dilute it out. It's trying to dilute it out. Well, if you let it go long enough, what will actually happen is the dialysis tubing will burst because protein can't make it out. So there's a pressure that arises as a result of osmotic imbalance. Pressure arises as a result of osmotic imbalance. Okay? Things like to achieve balance of concentration. In this situation, we would have an imbalance across this membrane. There would actually be a pressure of sort across this membrane. Well, the ions in this case can't move. This is an ion over here. These are ions over here. They can't move across the membrane. What can move across the membrane is water. Just like water can move across the dialysis tubing, so too can water move across the lipid bilayer. Well, if I have an imbalance and I've got water out there, what's going to happen to this membrane? Well, this is going to this is going to diffuse water until some pressure is achieved to equalize the, the, stopping the movement. All right? That's what's going to happen. We're going to see water moving across the membrane because it can do so readily. All right? Well, if the pressure is high enough, that, that pressure can burst the membrane. So why do I tell you that? Well, I tell you that because a couple days ago I showed you a protein called the sodium-potassium ATPase. The sodium-potassium ATPase pumps out three ions of sodium at the same time as it pumps in two ions of potassium, or essentially at the same time. Okay? Why does the cell do that? It uses ATP energy to do it, so it must be important because ATP energy is pretty precious for the cell. Why does it do it? The reason it does it is to help maintain osmotic balance. If the cell did not do that, the osmotic imbalance that would result would burst the cell. Okay? The osmotic imbalance that would occur would burst the cell. Now, it's very complicated in terms of what actually makes osmotic balance, so we're not going to go into that here. But I will suffice it to tell you that this sodium-potassium ATPase is important enough that if you stop it, you will ultimately kill the cell. Cells have to maintain that osmotic balance because without it, water will diffuse in and the cell will burst. This tells us that living has a pretty good energetic price. For a cell to be alive, it's got to maintain that osmotic balance. Otherwise, it's going to burst and it's, it's doomed. Very important. OK. Well. Diffusion, okay, I, I, there's another point I want to make here. So diffusion, we're not going to worry about this equation, by the way. Don't worry about that. Diffusion is an important consideration. All right? So what's diffusion? When I say diffusion, tell me what that means. Yeah, it's the movement of materials from a high concentration to a low concentration. All right? If diffusion, if these small ions could move across the membrane, they would, and everything would equalize, and we would be set because it would move from this higher concentration on the left to the lower concentration on the right until things basically equalized. If I take a glass of water and I drop a drop of ink into it, I give enough time, the ink will diffuse all the way through the glass, and it'll be done. It won't, it won't change anymore after that. Okay? So diffusion is one way for things to move. All right? And even though things don't move very rapidly across a membrane like this, if we gave it enough time, the slow rate of movement would ultimately equalize these two. Okay? Well, that's not a very efficient way to do things. Let's imagine that this thing on the outside here is glucose. And let's imagine that on here, this is the inside the cell on the right, 
and the cell needs glucose, and it's hungry, and here's all this glucose over here. What's going to happen? Okay. Well, if we wait for glucose to diffuse across, the cell will starve to death. Okay. So does that mean that we pump it in? Well, in some cases it means we do, yes. But not in all cases. Okay. Not in all cases. So when I say the word pump, what does the word pump come bring to mind? It requires energy, right? It requires energy. When I'm pumping something, an old mechanical pump, I'm exerting energy. If I am pumping water and I plug in a pump, it's using energy to do that. So when I use the pump, it means energy is involved. I'm, fi I'm fighting a battle. I'm making something happen. Okay? Cells don't like to waste energy unless they need to. So I'm going to give you a really good example. Let's imagine this is a blood cell. The guy on the right is a blood cell. It doesn't have too much glucose inside of it, and the blood is floating around this nice liquid environment, and the liquid environment is full of glucose. Okay? Full of meaning at a reasonable level that it's not poisoning you, glucose being a poison. right? Okay? Well, the cell could burn some energy to move glucose in, but hey, diffusion would get it in. Isn't there a way to get it in? It turns out there is. Cells have, uh, blood cells in particular, have proteins that have little tiny openings in them that will only allow certain molecules to pass through them. There are certain um, proteins called GLUTs, G-L-U-T. They stand for glucose transporters. And they just provide little openings for glucose to diffuse into the cell, going from a higher concentration out to a lower concentration in. And the beauty of these things is they are specific. They won't let anything through except glucose. This is pretty good. It means the cell is not wasting energy bringing something in that wants to come in all, all on its own. Okay. And it's not letting in all kinds of trash as a result. It's very specific in terms of what it actually is letting in. Okay. So these are really very useful then for cells to get things in. Well, not all things are in higher concentration outside the cell than inside. Yes, sir? Um, there are gluts that are not. There are gluts that are. Yeah. So, so yeah. OK. So. We use the term passive diffusion to mean we're not exerting any energy to get it in. We're not pumping. Okay? We simply have openings that allow things to move through based on the difference in concentration. That would have to mean that the concentration is higher outside of the glut, I'm sorry, outside the cell than inside the cell. Okay. Well, we don't always have the beauty of having that, con that, that situation. Okay? We don't always have the beauty of that. All right? This is actually this is another example of the blood cell I was just telling you about. Glucose outside higher concentration than glucose in, meaning it's about 5 millimolar. Inside it's less than 5 millimolar. Facilitated diffusion, in this case glucose permease, allows the glucose to come floating into the cell. Everybody's happy. Okay? Blood's an unusual, um, blood cells are unusual in that respect. Most of the cells of our body don't have that situation where there's a higher concentration of glucose out than there is in. OK. Well, active transport requires what I call a pump. Pumping. Why do cells pump? Cells pump because they're trying to move something against a concentration gradient, against it. When I say against it, it means they're trying to move something from a low concentration into a higher concentration. Trying to move something from a low concentration into a higher concentration. It's the cellular equivalent of trying to move water uphill. And that's why the pump is relevant. Because the only way you're going to move water uphill is by pumping it. It's not going to go uphill naturally. Okay? Well, this shows you, all right, this shows you the very same sodium potassium ATP as I showed you the other day, but it shows it to you in more detail. And no, I'm not going to take you through all the steps or hold you responsible for them. Okay? But I will remind you that sodium potassium ATPase is called an ATPase because it requires ATP energy to do its thing. It requires ATP energy to do its thing. OK? 
right? You can see that ATP energy being exerted here. And you can see the phosphate that it puts on doing things throughout this process, ultimately coming off. The net result of which is you change the nature of the opening from facing inwards to facing outwards to facing back inwards again. That takes energy to do. And in the process, ions get moved. Okay? So this is a really good example of something that's being moved against the concentration gradient. Because out here, where the sodium is being moved, the sodium concentration is higher out here than it is inside the cell. The potassium concentration is higher out here than it is, I'm, I'm sorry, is it higher inside the cell than it is outside the cell. So it's counting both those. You might say, well, it's creating all kinds of osmotic pressure, isn't it? Well, as I said, it's complicated. It's balancing other things. Because remember, there's proteins in here that aren't present outside the cell. So there's a balance that's being achieved in creating this artificial osmotic pressure that helps the cell to maintain its integrity. OK. Um, here's an example of cells are amazing in terms of the um, diversity of ways in which they will um, use and find opportunity. Okay? Here's an example of something that cells readily do. Cells, as we will see, uh, particularly things, uh, organelles within cells, pump protons, meaning they move protons across a membrane. Okay? This is something that bacteria do. Okay? Bacteria pump protons outside of them. There's, there are reasons why. We won't go into it here. But one of the reasons, one of the upshots of this is that by pumping protons outside the cell, they reduce, I'm sorry, they increase their inner pH, and they decrease the pH outside the cell. That means that there's a higher concentration of protons outside the cell than there is inside the cell. And those protons want to come in. They want to come in. Well, this, this little um, uh, thing over here called the galactoside permease is a way to let protons in. But there's a catch. And it's a very cool catch. They will not let the protons in unless they are accompanied by lactose. Lactose is an energy source for these cells. Lactose is an energy source for these cells. So the cell says, OK, I'm going to pump some protons out. But this gives me what I would call potential energy. <laughs> potential energy. It can be used because now we've got a high concentration that wants in. They bring in lactose with them, and the cell is happy. Notice that the cell is using a concentration gradient to make something happen. It's using a concentration gradient to move something against a different concentration gradient. What does that mean? Lactose is higher inside the cell than it is outside the cell. So two important points about this, and I want you to note both of them. One important point. It does not require that every every active transport use ATP. There is no ATP bringing this lactose in. So not all active transport systems require ATP. Okay. The other important point is that this constant uh, is that um, this is a, um, an active transport system. You just a second, please. Okay. This is an active transport system. How do we know it's an, an active transport system? An active transport system occur, uh, exists when at least one molecule is being moved against the concentration gradient. At least one molecule is moving against the concentration gradient. In this case, that molecule is lactose. Otherwise, it would simply be diffusion. Because this would just be diffusing back into the cell. Did you have a question? Yeah, what powers the ATP powers the proton. Well, it varies. Uh, ATP can power the proton pump. Or in some cases, this is actually done in photosynthetic bacteria by light. So it varies. 
Yes. I'm sorry? Well, in this case, the pump is actually over here. So I'm calling this guy uh, a pump. So I'm not, I'm not ca calling the two together a pump. So this guy is a pump. This is also a pump, OK? But so in this case, it's being moved out. But because th I'm only considering this one, these protons are moving with a concentration gradient. Right, but it's still a proton coming out of the end plus the second one. This one over here would be active transport. That's correct. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't understand your question. Yeah. Did I see another hand? OK. All right. Let's see. So um, another thing to consider about membranes that's important is I'm talking about proteins that move things across membranes. And we've already had the example we talked about over here that steroids, for example, can cross membranes to some extent on their own. There are other things that, um, other ways for things to cross cell membranes that we need to be aware of. And one is what you see on the screen right here. Everybody, I'm <coughs> sure, has heard of LDLs. LDLs are what your doctor will say, bad cholesterol, OK? Well, your body has LDLs for a reason. And one of the primary reasons it has LDLs is to deliver things like cholesterol into cells. That's why LDLs exist. So your body has LDLs. LDLs, as we'll talk about later, carry cholesterol. They carry fat-soluble vitamins. They may carry other lipids within them. And when the cell binds, when they bind to the cell surface, there are specific receptors, that is specific proteins on the cell surface, that will bind to the LDL, and it will get engulfed. You can see this LDL being engulfed in here, and the goodies ultimately get all chewed up and used. So an LDL receptor is ultimately a source of cholesterol for the cell to put back into its membrane. And it comes in by the mechanism that you see here. The other things that are in there might include fats, like I said, fat-soluble vitamins, things like that that the cell would have use for and benefit from as well. OK. All right. We're getting close. We're almost done. Um, Fat-soluble vitamins. There are two classes of vitamins uh, to be aware of. These are the vitamins we would refer to as lipids. Okay? They include vitamins A, D, E, and K. They are fairly water insoluble, meaning they are hydrophobic. They each have important functions in the body. Vitamin A's primary function is uh, as a role in vision, but there are forms of vitamin A that also play roles in differentiation. Okay. Vitamin D, something that your body makes a lot of if you go outside in the sun today. Um, I hope nobody did that today. But um, anyway, vitamin D is produced. We'll see later in the in the uh, in the term um, by a reaction that's actually um, uh, stimulated by uh, sunlight, and vitamin D is very important for regulation of phosphorus and calcium metabolism. Phosphorus and calcium are important components of bones. That's what we use to make bones. And I always like to catch all the students in my um, beginning classes and say that vitamin D is a very important vitamin. Vitamin D also has some important properties with respect to being anti-cancer, helping to prevent cancer. And shockingly, most people's level of, levels of vitamin D are low. And they don't know it. Okay. Now, I like to tell this to young people because this is the time in your life when you should be getting vitamin D. I'm not saying go out and sunburn and yourself to do that. That's not the way to do it. You can take supplements of vitamin D that will help boost your levels of vitamin D. Now, why do I say this? Because when you see old people who are all bent over from osteoporosis and their bones are falling apart, you hear about how fragile their bones are. Those processes started not when they were old. They started when they were your age. Okay, It's particularly a problem for young women. You want to make sure you're getting plenty of vitamin D, you're getting plenty of calcium in your diets, because those things can be problematic for you that you turn 50 or 60, and all of a sudden you realize, 
wow, I've got osteoporosis, you don't turn back the clock. Okay? So the things that you do now make a big difference in terms of the health that you will have the older that you get. So make sure you get plenty of vitamin D. Vitamin E is the one that we know the least about. Vitamin E is an interesting uh, vitamin. It is one that we classify as an antioxidant, meaning that it helps protect against damage from reactive oxygen species. And reactive oxygen species are very damaging to cells. They can cause mutations. They can damage the proteins. If allowed to go uh, uncontrolled, um, they will kill the cell. So antioxidants, things that prevent damage from oxidation, are very, very important. We have several in our uh, cells. Vitamin E is one. It appears to help protect membranes, which we've been talking about. Vitamin C is another one, and it's water-soluble. So this guy is lipid, is lipid, meaning it's not water-soluble, and we have one, at least one water-soluble one as well, vitamin C. There are others uh, in addition. The last um, lipid-soluble vitamin that is um, uh, water-insoluble is vitamin K. And vitamin K, uh, again, as we will see later, plays a very important role in clotting of blood. Okay? Vitamin K stimulates a reaction that is required for blood clotting. It's a very critical component. OK. Um, I think I have a, enough. Would you guys like to do a song, or would you like to just go? Let's just go. All right. 